everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Ben Steele Turner. Ben is a physiotherapist having graduated from the University of Bournemouth with a master's also in uh, human nutrition and he's also lectured on nutrition for musculoskeletal health. He's been a guest speaker for the Ossa Surrey uh, Knee Convention as well and he's also got himself a background in personal training and he's competed in uh, bodybuilding fitness competitions as well. Now, Ben, listen, that's you summed up in a really tiny little nutshell. Why don't you give us a two minute introduction about yourself? And uh, then we're just going to dive on in about nutrition and physiotherapy. And then we're going to talk about the ethics around social media uh, towards the end of it. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me on the podcast. Yeah. So a little bit more. So I'm not just some stranger chatting down, chatting <laughs> down your earphones, but yeah. So originally I worked as a personal trainer kind of straight after I finished college here in the UK, went on to study bachelor's in physio. And whilst I was doing that, I was doing, uh, like Sunny mentioned, I was doing bodybuilding fitness model competition. So I inherently became very interested in what I was eating. And then that transferred into me thinking a lot about how important it would be for what our patients were eating as well. I wasn't quite done studying. So I went to the University of Surrey, did a human nutrition master's. And then that's kind of led to this dual profession uh, with physiotherapy and nutrition. And I think kind of how I like to tie it together is, you know, we do so much work, great work as physios. And I just really feel we have a, a duty to be able to speak about nutrition a little bit more confidently, like absolutely we're not trying to get physiotherapists to become dietitians, to become nutritionists, but just have a little bit more awareness. Cause I don't know about you, but in our physio, I could have caught, I could have graduated with hundred percent in physiotherapy and not known what protein fats and carbs are or what calorie balance is. But as soon as I slap on my physio, uh, what uniform and I'm at work, if I tell someone, Oh, you know, something about nutrition, I'm a healthcare professional. They'll believe me yet we haven't actually had any kind of input on it. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. No, absolutely. And uh, I like that you highlighted it nice and early as well. We're not trying to convince people to become nutritionists or dietitians, but it is super, super important. Now, during uh, my study, the reason that I chose the minor that I chose was because there was supposed to be uh, nutrition within that minor as well. However, it ended up being one lecture on someone who designed an app and wanted input from students. So that was a (laughs) bit of a a, a sham sale from, from those guys. So my nutrition knowledge isn't quite where I want it to be. It's only so much as probably as you yourself know, um, from your uh, personal training qualifications, as much as you cover in that. So it's also still really shallow, really only surface deep. Um, but, Before we start jumping in on the nutrition aspect, let's give people an idea of what it is that you do physiotherapy wise and then where this relates into your work as well. So what sort of patients is it you treat and what is it that you do? Yes. So so musculoskeletal physiotherapy, I've always been uh, in the UK and and I work in private practice. I do see NHS patients for an NHS contract as well. I qualified as a physio four and a half years ago, so I'm still very aware. I'm really, really in the relatively early stages of my career. And I, I, a lot of, I haven't yet developed what I would call a clinical specialty. So I'm still seeing a wide range of musculoskeletal complaints uh, and then referring on to people who are more specialist in a particular area when needed. So it can, it, I mean, it can be all, all musculoskeletal complaints, orthopedic, um, sports, and then through my nutrition stuff, I, it's, it's always difficult to tie the nutrition in with physio because some people, they're coming for physiotherapy, they're paying for you for physiotherapy. And so that's where I'll bring the nutrition in. And then aside from the physio, I see uh, mainly online people for nutrition advice consultations. Um, but physiotherapy wise, yeah, all musculoskeletal, private practice, NHS patients in the UK as well. Uh, across locations in uh, Surrey, just uh, southeast England. Okay, fantastic. And then if we look at your patient population, you also work with student athletes as well uh, from uh, our little brief conversation before we jumped on uh, to record. Um, Can you give us a little idea 
about what it is you do with them there. So you've got your general uh, in clinic patients, and then you've also got these guys as well. Yeah. So this is um, with with students, and it can be students who we, uh, at, a, at a clinic for school age who just require physiotherapy for for whatever issue. But it, through default, it, it tends to be a lot of work with the people who are playing rugby because <laughs> they're getting injured a lot more than the people who aren't. Um, so that then is a lot more geared towards uh, working with the S&C coach there. We're doing rehab uh, from injury, maintaining their sport participation, uh, and then taking that through the continuum into handing it over to S&C to boost performance and, 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 and boost, uh, boost yeah, their performance on the rugby pitch or hockey pitch or cricket field, whatever. Um, so it's a really nice mix uh, and a, and a good variety, uh, I'd say, in my work week, for sure. Grand. So one of the reasons I wanted to highlight that uh, and, and bring that to the fore is that um, from personal experience as well, one of the things I noticed with someone who is really athletically minded, shall we say, so people who are really sporty, as soon as they get an injury, they either go one of two ways from what I've seen. Either they really um cut back on their food intake because they think ah I'm, I'm not doing enough i can't justify it or they start binging because they cannot maintain that lifestyle that they like that thing that they like to do so yeah students but also people that you see in clinic as well are going to have that what's your take on that and what do you think when people start cutting back or then start binging yeah, you've hit an absolute gold mine there, Sonny, I have to say. So I couldn't agree more with that kind of that uh like two different extremes is really, really important. And basically, um, it's our job to stop people going down both of those routes and keep them on on the good avenue that they were straight ahead. So if we start off with the first of all, like cutting back. So someone's had, say, a pretty bad injury, whatever that may be, uh, then their training's gone way, way down. So they don't want to put on body fat because they want to stay in athletic and they want to stay good for their sport. So they start eating way, way less. So from a nutrition point of view, uh, you've suddenly got this injury. It requires nutrients, macronutrients, micronutrients to get better. And then all of a sudden, uh, you're, you're suddenly restricting that from your body. So you might not be getting enough protein. You might not be hitting your calorie goal. You might not be getting you know, an optimal amount of micronutrients each day. And that's, you know, not the be all and end all because your body can find other ways around it, but it's certainly, certainly going to hamper your performance. So if you, uh, let's say it's a pretty major one, you require surgery, you know, you've got a stress response. Your body requires glucose. It requires amino acids to, to heal whatever the injury is. And if you're not getting enough protein, your body's then got to use your protein stores. So your, your lean body mass to to go towards and heal that so then if we're trying to get back to kind of peak performance asap basically we're definitely hindering what we would all be trying to do in physio which is build as much muscle as possible and then the counter argument for that or the counter option sorry where people kind of um it's the the effort phenom phenomenon um people say where they go ah oh, just whatever i'll eat whatever you know then they might, they're probably more likely to be reaching all their nutrition goals, but it's certainly not ideal. You're then going to be left with uh, a big num big uh, risk of increased body fat after. So really, this probably leads to a nice kind of summary take-home point early on in this podcast. If you're just a musculoskeletal physio and you've got someone who's injured, you really want to keep their habitual diet assuming their habitual diet is pretty good if they're athletic minded the same stop them veering off course too much and absolutely avoid an energy deficit like when you're injured if your priority is getting that injury recovered you're not trying to diet for your holiday or whatever uh you know get the injury better give it what it's give it what it needs um you know it needs more calories that, to heal even if you're doing more activity you, your your calorie needs has not suddenly fallen off a cliff and uh, what you said there about preparing for holiday, it's not a case of I've, I'm injured, so no carbs before marbs kind of thing. Yeah. It's really, you know, keep things going the way that it should be. Yeah. And 
One of the things you mentioned there was your protein intake. Now, if someone's injured, let's say um, it's a surgery, yeah. what sort of nutrition or supplements do you think would be an idea for someone to have in their head? Because look, at the end of the day, everyone's individual, from me to yeah. you, to my missus, to uh, Joe walking down the street. Yeah. Everyone has their own individual needs. Everyone's yeah. got to be tailored. So you can't unfortunately walk away and say, right, Ben said 50 grams of X. You know, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, what are the general sort of guidelines that people can have in their head from, all right, cool. I need to have so much protein compared yeah. to this. You know, it's percentages on a plate, right? The portion of your plate yeah. is, yeah. So, yeah, so I'll preface, this is all general guidance. Do not take this as prescription. Yeah. But so let's say you've had a surgery. So uh, after surgery, your, your body's ramped up to try and heal. So we get a little bit of a stress response. So your body's basically gone into a, a catabolic environment where it's demanding, it will break down some of your tissue, but it's demanding this to be healed. So in terms of calories, um, let's say it's quite a major surgery. It's so like a knee replacement, ACL for a short period after, if you've got your basal metabolic rate, so that's how many calories you individually or your patient would use just in a normal day where they get up, don't do any exercise, um, for a, you know, maybe for a week or so after, don't quote me on the exact time. Even if you're not doing any exercise, you probably want to add up to 50% of that onto your calorie. So a lot, right? Something more minor, such as a dislocation, maybe up to 20%. If it's something like severe burns over like a large portion of your body, that can be your calorie needs can go up uh, two or three times, even if you're just to, to heal it. So energy wise, work out your, um, your energy balance. So that would be if you're bang on in the middle, you're taking in exactly what you're burning. Absolutely do not go below that. And then dependent on the severity of the injury, you probably want to eke into more and more. So that's the first one, as we already covered. Calorie balance, you got to be getting that. Protein, the numbers vary. I'm not sure the literature entirely agrees because different ones have to come up. From all the reading I've done, the figure that is come to be kind of minimum is 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of your body weight per day, which is quite a lot considering that the the British Nutrition Foundation reference nutrient intake for for adults in the UK is only 0.75. And so 1.6, yeah, so it's over double. It's a, yeah. it's a lot. I believe there is talk that the the UK guidelines need to increase their kind of baseline protein because 0.75 is very, very low. Um, so 1.6, um, some papers suggest up to 2.5 and I believe three grams per kilogram as well. So if you're an 80 kilogram male, that's 240 grams of protein a day is a lot, an awful lot. Jeez. And it's really hard to get in. Um, but the main message that I would, I've talked about and that I would give as a, remember this is a, this is a physio tutors podcast. So for physios, it, the basic information you would say to your patient regarding protein is absolutely do not reduce protein by trying to have less. So maintain whatever protein you're getting, keep it if possible and you want to try and work out how much and increase it if you can. The other thing as well is it will be beneficial, even if you kept the exact same grams of protein to just make it more frequent throughout the day. So if you normally just have a big bit of, you know, you have two chicken breasts at dinner and you probably have little protein throughout the day. If you can just split that up and have one earlier in the day, you're already winning. If you can split them in half and have them four times throughout the day, even better. Um, and timing them, uh, timing that, somewhat around your your rehab as well with protein so so many people will come in and be like yep yeah, great i'm doing all your exercises you're giving me I, I get up first thing in the morning and i do the exercises and it's like that's brilliant doing them however you're effectively doing rehab fasted which if you want to train and uh you know there is definitely a time and place for adding fasted re fasted training in for other purposes like performance or weight loss if that's a time that suits you to train but when the goal is to rebuild that tendon or to get these muscles stronger don't train fasted have <laughs> have some food before and definitely around it so yeah energy balance protein 1.6 minimum is the figure that's given and then you mentioned supplements or nutrients i think um i never recommend 
sup uh, you recommend what people need to be getting to and if they need to supplement it then then that's fine and particularly with protein like if you're trying to get 150 200 grams of protein in a day it's really hard to get that from whole foods so you know if one of your portions of protein becomes a protein supplement then fine it doesn't matter i wouldn't have free protein shakes a day but um if it's needed to then they're in terms of supplements it's it's really really tricky um but the the ones definitely you're in amsterdam i'm here we're both quite northern on the on the globe <laughs> vitamin d this time of year is is pretty rainy outside my window today um you know during the winter if you live in the you know uh, i believe it's 35 degrees latitude or north so pretty much anywhere in europe and above from october to march september to march time you're not getting vitamin d even if it's a sunny day you're not getting enough um you're definitely not getting enough from your diet do you know how much how many eggs you have to eat to get your day's vitamin d requirement Ooh, I believe, um, I think it's, have a guess uh, all right i'm gonna assume it's a lot so let's say six no it's 24 what? i think from the figure i saw the other day yeah 24 eggs so um Jeez. and i don't think the people in the elevator will be very happy if you eat 24 eggs oh, uh, Oh, that's uh, I be believe grim. that's. I think that's that's. I saw that the other day. Uh, uh, anyway, long story short, vitamin D is one of the few supplements that you can that is routinely anyhow in the UK kind of advised ten micrograms. So that's that should be the case for anyone. I would just look at it as if your goal or your patient's goal is to recover from this injury optimally. Why would you not? do everything you can like why would you not tick every box like some people aren't bothered and that's you know you can't it's not that's their, it's their choice but the people who are bothered why would you not do that um if there's a little chance of toxicity definitely always get individual advice but let's summarize because i'm definitely going into a little bit of a ramble make sure people are getting their energy goal make sure they're getting enough protein and at bare minimum they're spreading the protein throughout the day it's not all in one big thing um nutrients if if you live in a country that doesn't get much sun and is quite northern, then a vitamin D supplement in the winter and then other supplements um, would be used if and when a nutritionist or a dietitian thinks there is a realm. I think we're going into very dodgy territory if we start openly saying people should be taking this supplement. Take, zinc, take selenium, about. take, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you mentioned spreading out the protein over the course of the day. Now, yeah. is there a biological reason for this or is it just to make it more palatable for someone to eat? Uh, yeah, it, it's just so that the, uh, it's just so that the, those amino acids, which effective, I, I just use the, the visualization that they're like the, the bricks, right? They are the building blocks of, of your muscle and your connective tissue and your bones. Um, it, it's just so that you're, you're getting, you're getting them in a timely fashion because then your body's, you know, it's not like if you have all your protein in one go, that's ideal for, you know, absorbing the most of it. If you can have a small portion throughout the day, it means your body's never got that time where it hasn't got a supply of amino acids um so uh the the you're maintaining supply basically. yeah you're maintaining supply exactly I, i'm this is not a hugely you know scientific thing this is just an analogy but this is how i i personally explain it to kind of summarize the nutrition and the physio is let's say you've uh you've got a brick layer and you're you've got a brick layer and you want to build an extension on your house so you already have your house which is your body um if you want to build an extension on that you you've got the brick layer so that there's got to be physical activity that's key there's got to be exercise if there's no brick layer doing the exercise doing the activity you will never have a wall no matter how many bricks and mortar you have it's impossible right you'll just have an infinite pile of bricks and mortar if you um if you just have the brick layer uh he probably can take some bricks and mortar from elsewhere in the house i.e you know if you're trying to heal your achilles you're not getting much protein your body does have the ability to break down amino acids and provide them but you're just taking bricks from somewhere else in your house Mm. and then equally the bricklayer is only there nine to five each day so why would you give him all the bricks boom all at one go because he can only go at one rate whereas if you've got a helper who's bringing him a wheelbarrow 
every three hours, here's enough bricks. As the last one gets laid, here's another wheelbarrow that is not backed up by science. It's just a nice kind of analogy to make kind of summarize it. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's one of the things that, that uh, Clint mentioned as well is making sure that you spread and eat regularly yeah. because your body needs fuel over the course of the day. It doesn't just need fuel at the end of the day. And yeah. it's not going to say, all right, we got everything last night at seven o'clock. Yeah. Um, I can still use that, you know, that the next day at uh, yeah. nine in the morning. Obviously the body can, but it's better for the body if the nutrition is the bioavailability of the nutrition, exactly. I think is the important aspect yeah. that, that um, we're trying to edge towards here. Yeah. Um, so with that said though, it's not just the protein on its own that someone needs to be taken in to ensure there's good uptake, right? There needs to be yep. other factors that people need to ensure stay in their diet. Now, yep. what are the things surrounding the protein that also need to be going in there? Yeah, r- really good point. So your the your any one nutrient in isolation is never going to be going to be hugely hugely important. So let's say uh, you're getting enough protein, your body's absorbing it. So I think probably most prominent for us with the emerging evidence I'm personally most interested in is vitamin C. Uh, So vitamin C is the cofactor for the enzymes that synthesize collagen. So collagen is obviously hugely important as I'm sure every physio uh, listening will know in in connective tissue. Um, So if vitamin C is required to get the enzymes to do the activity to turn those amino acids into collagen you've got to be having enough vitamin c and the important thing about vitamin c is it's uh it's uh it's water soluble so your body stores it incredibly poorly so uh you you can't say right i'm gonna have i'm gonna take a big old vitamin c supplement and i'm gonna eat loads of kiwis and strawberries and broccoli on sunday and that's gonna see me through until next sunday it needs to be a daily priority that you're that you're getting getting it in. Um, so that's probably that's probably the main one. I would say vitamin C in terms of protein uh, uh, um, alongside kind of getting it to getting it to do its job best. I think people underestimate the steps involved. They think right, here's my food. It's full of protein. I'm going to eat the protein, and the protein's going to magically appear as a bigger muscle or as a you know stronger tendon or what have you, but it, your body will still digest it down to its constituent amino acids and then has to take those amino acids and then dependent on where you're exercising, you know, if you're putting, if you're putting stress and on your biceps by resistance training them well, then the amino acids can go there. Your body repairs that to, in order to adapt and become stronger and it then needs to build it back up. So that's probably where the vitamin C is most important. And, and then obviously you mentioned the collagen there. So, yeah. um, you're also going to need carbs in your diet because one of the other things that people shut down on is carbs because yeah. there's this big or has been in the past at least this big idea that carbs aren't necessarily the best thing for you and that can't yeah. be further from the truth because we need it yeah uh, it's essential for hormones raging for our body as well without those yeah. carbs can you can you maybe talk to us about the importance of that as well in the diet especially for someone recovering yeah. So I would say kind of the most simple takeaway in terms of how, like what protein, uh, what carbs, sorry, are important is that one of the, other than tasting great, we'll get that out of the way, <laughs> um, is that they're protein and fat sparing. So, um, I had to summarize this really. So you're by giving, getting carbohydrates, which is then going to be, you know, used as glucose, used as energy for you to function. It then, frees up and allows your dietary fats and your protein to do their job um whereas if you're suddenly really low on carbs your body's got to then so um amino acids can be made into glucose gluconeogenesis in the liver um but then therefore you might you're you're using your protein to do what carbs should be doing um so therefore that's not really optimal um that's not really optimal for anyone additionally you know and i know as we talked about before people have got a pretty strenuous rehab routine your carbs are going to give you the energy to do that exercise so if if you're not getting if you're not getting um 
a decent amount of carbohydrates you're probably i know some people do love ketosis and say that they feel great on keto um not not something i personally promote in any way but for the vast 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 majority if you're getting a good amount of carbohydrates each day and you're fueling it around your workout you're going to have plenty of energy which means you can then go in you can provide that stress you can do that resistance exercise you can load your muscles you can load your tissues and then the protein can be used to help you adapt build back stronger and then progress that over time and i think that's probably where the carbs come in is that yeah yeah they're, they're gonna they're they're allowing you to do the do the work that then triggers the adaptation and then the protein's job as it does it so everyone's got their little job um and my little analogy again would be if you've got a football team with defenders midfielders and strikers you have to field defenders midfielders and strikers if you take all the midfielders out all you're doing is putting your substitute defenders and strikers in midfield like why not just play the people that are good at playing in midfield <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah nice um I think again, if if we then use the the bricklayer analogy that you said as well, it's yeah. like taking bricks from elsewhere where they yeah. could be better used in the fireplace, and so now you're going to stick it on the extension. Yeah. Well, yeah, you've kind of done yourself a disservice by taking elements away from where where else it could have been. Now, if we look a bit broader, then yeah. from the the sort of carbs or, or protein if it, it is the timing of intake that important because there is i think an element to say you don't necessarily need to time every single meal to every single training session because you're let's face it you're not going to be preparing for the olympics you're not preparing for, for some people are. A, some, some people might be, but <laughs> let's just take it in general. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be preparing for something like that. So the timing of your food isn't going to be as important to Joe Bloggs down the road as it would be for your elitist of elite athletes. No. Right? Yeah. So um, so there's a, there's a really, really interesting topic. And this is definitely one that's kind of done the rounds a little bit on social media where per, when when i was first going to the gym you know once i had finished my last set and i was going back to my uh back to my car or to the changing room to get my chicken breast in tupperware don't try and talk to me because i need my chicken every second until i get my chicken i'm wasting away um, and, and, and 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 that and i did you know from watching people on youtube that was what i believed yeah you know, i was carrying a chicken breast wrapped in tin foil ready for as soon as i finished because that's what i thought and um so i would say this is summarized perfectly um by a uh, research of uh sean ent from the us and he uh, him and his colleagues wrote a, a paper and the title of the paper is uh nutrient timing it's not an anabolic window uh, but a garage door of opportunity and uh, what a brilliant title right and, um, and what they mean by that is it's not this tiny tiny little space where you have you've got this tiny bit where you have to get your your nutrition in or all's lost um there's this it's it's huge widely ranging so the first thing would be if um if you can get your nutrition in and around your training so before or after but you know close to then why wouldn't you like why choose not to there's no there's no harm in having food 10 minutes after um but there probably is a little bit of detriment if you wait three or four hours like if you can have it straight after then do because that's the time where where the nutrition is needed um so i would say that the the, the in terms of rehab for for your your standard musculoskeletal thing is avoid them training doing it fasted so make sure there are some there's some protein there's some carbs there's some fats there's some micronutrients in the system ready to go because that's what your body's going to need to recover optimally and to fuel it um and the goal of the exercise is to get this injury better not to try and lose weight or at this stage to try and boost performance. Now, absolutely. If you're trying to boost your endurance performance or your speed output, or power output, there is a place for training for, for or carbohydrate fasted. But if the goal is to optimally get stronger and rehab an injury, 
just make sure they're there. Um, and then the other thing is taking the bigger picture. If someone's got, say, quite a packed rehab schedule or a packed performance schedule where uh, um, they've got to perform or they've got matches or training quite close together, then definitely nutrition time, nutrient timing becomes more important because if you if you are asking someone to do say six reset sessions a week, 24 hours is not very long between them. Um, and so if someone's waiting then four or five hours after one before they're fueling themselves, that's quite a big, that's quite a sizable percentage of the time, their recovery time where they're not recovering optimally um, before you're asking the muscles to do the same again. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's important. However, it's more important to hit your protein goal and your energy goal. Once you've hit those, then worry about the timing uh, would be my summary. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And then what if we're talking about someone who is um, going through rehab, but they're still yeah. also performing? What are the uh, okay. optimal yeah. things that we need for that person? Because yeah. they're not going to need the same amount of, of protein in relation to carbs that they would have had if they were just pure on the road to recovery doing nothing else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that makes it even more important probably because they've kind of got dual. And I'd say that's this, now you said it, that's really quite common because um, they need to make sure they're adequately fueled for both. And I would say it makes it uh, even more important that they're fueling adequately timed around their rehab or their, you know, their match or their training, what have you. Uh, because let's say they, uh, they, they, they're training on Wednesday and then they've got a match on Friday and you're asking them to do a rehab session on Thursday. Thursday now has, has two functions. Thursday is a rehab day and it's also a recovery day. So they've got to fuel the rehab and recover for the next one. So it doesn't, it's not like you can magically go, Oh, well in that case, they need to take this supplement or take or eat this food. They, it's the, you're still a human being first. They just require the same stuff. It just makes it more important. So in that case, I would probably be more, more keen on that. You know, after your match on Wednesday, let's get some protein, let's get some carbs, let's get some fats in pretty sharpish. You know, you know, definitely, um, uh, yeah, within an hour after for sure, maximum, probably uh, you could probably stretch to two, but if they're at that level where they're performing and rehabbing, they're probably, you know, pretty on it and pretty keen to do it. You know, why, why wait to two hours unless there's an absolute reason, you know, you can all, that's the time where a supplement becomes useful because it might be the matches away on a Wednesday or training's two hour drive away. So they physically can't get to the kitchen. So that's where the supplement becomes a tool to use because they can have that soon after. Um, uh, and then on the Wednesday, you know, they would have just a normal day of eating time, their food intake around their nutrition, uh, around their rehab, sorry, uh, and make sure that they're also getting enough carbohydrates, getting the nutrients ready to perform again Friday. So, yeah, they've got a pretty tough week, this this fictional character. <laughs> Sounds like you're speaking about someone specific, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, how is it then or? how is it that you combine it into your rehab with your patients, this yeah. element of nutrition, how, how in depth are you going? Yeah. I think it, it always really, really, um, cause I'm, I'm a physiotherapist first nutrition sec nutritionist second, right? So I'm, I'm primarily a physiotherapist with an incredible interest in nutrition and a registered associate nutrition. Right? That's right. Um, not, not, not vice versa. So some people, will be incredibly receptive to it and they want to know more and they want me to send them links and articles and videos and they want to know how am I doing this and other people uh who aren't so receptive I'll still provide the advice but in a much briefer less kind of in less depth and then you know I mean I could talk about this till the cows come home so then and other people I'll I'll go in in incredible depth so I think it really depends and it also really depends on on the person as well um if they if it's someone who is a is an athlete or they've got some kind of sporting performance that they're going for then i'll 
I'll over egg it slightly and just be like, you know, if you want to get back to performance, you don't want to be under fueling. We really want to go for this. And therefore this is the advice I'd give. Um, and then there'll be other people who let's say it's something uh, less so uh Oh, it's always now you can't think of exactly a good example but let's say it's someone who's just uh, a keen keen walker and they might have got a lateral ankle sprain you know your body's going to get better i'm not like here to say the nutrition is like the be all and end all of course it helps if you're eating well and not drinking too much alcohol at that point but it, as long as you do your rehab well and you protect the joint you let it settle down you gradually build it back up it's going to get better and in that case i might say you know you know, you don't need to suddenly overhaul your diet, but make sure you're getting enough protein. I probably would avoid alcohol for a little bit because that's going to um, that's gonna inhibit some tissue healing and that jobs are good and for that. So hugely wide ranging. So um, you bring up something really interesting there, alcohol. Um, yeah. How, how can alcohol affect someone's recovery? What, what are the mechanisms there? Because yeah. I've noticed it myself... Um, when uh, prior to getting my surgery done and even after getting my surgery done during my rehab uh, for yeah. the knee, I noticed that alcohol had a big influence for how the knee felt the next day. If I'd gone yeah. out on a hard binge and I woke up not remembering how I got to bed, I'd have a sore knee and not because I'd fallen over. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, so do you mean what, act- why is alcohol bad basically? essentially yeah. what are the effects for alcohol let's not yeah. demonize alcohol because no, i think there's yeah, enough yeah. demonization no, no, uh, yeah, to yeah, go yeah. around everywhere uh, i love a drink before anyone yeah. says that but what are the effects of alcohol what's it going to do to our body so that we can understand it as rehab professionals because i've had many people talk to me about wanting to go out for someone's birthday drinks a couple yeah. of weeks after an operation or even uh, within a few days of a concussion or something like that yeah so uh, yeah with the concussion i'm a little bit more uh i pull them back a little bit more if yeah. it's really really sensitive yeah. to it um but yeah what what are the effects that alcohol can have yes yeah, so, so so um so in, for in, impairing the healing phases so definitely will impact the um inflammatory response uh and of course you know if you have one small glass of wine that's probably not going to have too huge an effect let's be honest but if you're starting to get up to you know a few pints of beer you know it might start to impact it um so definitely um the sooner after injury the greater impact because you know we know there's an inflammatory response your body's doing this this what i would describe as a miracle of mother nature miracle of healing tissue which is why i love physio you know if your car starts making a weird noise it doesn't start getting better by itself overnight whereas all our bodies do so that's amazing so alcohol is probably going to impair that process so much um and make the inflammatory response not so good and then um uh it also of course alcohol is a uh uh, diuretic so you know you're gonna not it's going to impact your hydration status um uh so that's not so great then if you have a hangover you're probably not going to do your rehab so well is another one i <laughs> i use because people don't generally want to not people aren't too interested in the that sort of stuff so that's going to yeah. impact it um and the the area i am least familiar on in the research so forgive me if i make an error but is it's um it's is it catabolic or it's 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 definitely not beneficial for an anabolic environment if you're having alcohol but i'm not 100 percent familiar i couldn't say a study that shows that um it's just something i'm aware of but i'll hold my hands up i probably need to do more reading into that um so so yeah so alcohol is such a tough one because you can see as soon as people come for an outpatient physiotherapy appointment they're doing a rehab and you say oh don't drink alcohol everyone's everyone your their ears prick up a bit and they're a little bit like oh okay um are you sure and it's it's definitely because people really value their you know their beers with their colleagues at the Beer on the, the friday the night they're going yeah. out for a nice meal on saturday and so it, it definitely goes against what we're all trying to achieve as physiotherapists where we're trying to make their rehab match to their lifestyle and everything to then start advising against alcohol so the I'm, tr- I'm trying to tie everything which i am very aware i'm on a physio podcast talk about nutrition so trying to tie everything up the advice i'd give is absolutely avoid heavy drinking like 
we all know with you know com- this, that is not going to be helpful for recovering from an injury um if it's your husband's 50th birthday at the weekend and you've rolled your ankle i probably wouldn't say don't have a glass of wine there because everybody's life is you know that's an important occasion in life so so that's yeah. important and it's definitely uh one of those where if injury rehab's a list right you've got your you've got your your physio your sleep what you're eating your levels of stress and alcohol is probably a little bit down on that list you know if you're nailing your rehab you're very low stress you're sleeping well and your food is good probably a bit of alcohol is neither here nor there not too important right um but uh if you can tick that box i.e you don't drink great that box is automatically ticked or if you were going to have just a couple of beers when you got home each evening and you just hold off on them for a few weeks it's going to help a little bit of course it's going to help a little bit how much Eh, i'm not sure um so yeah that'd be my answer so it's one of the tick boxes it's not one of the big tick boxes but if we as met the more boxes you can tick the better basically fantastic and Moving away from the nutrition uh, for a moment, um, we'll, we'll touch back onto that later. The yeah. reason that you and I uh, got chatting on Instagram was yes. uh, a great post, I think, that you shared about uh, we're recording this now in December. There was a recent uh, article that came out on CNN uh, by Bob and Brad's um, yeah about your sleeping position is bad and uh jeff cavalier of athlean also did his own uh little video on it and these guys have millions upon millions of people who follow them yeah and there became a massive massive backlash at least within the physiotherapy community i don't know much about the osteopath community and i don't know much about the athletic trainer community if there was such a backlash on it there um just people trashing them uh dragging them through the mud yeah and um you 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 had a post there what what was your post uh because you asked a question rather than digging in on anyone you asked the question yeah. which i thought was fantastic and i thought was a great way to to talk about it because you also have a following on social media you got people that listen to what you say you've been on podcasts you've done talks uh, at uh, knee conferences and you lecture yeah, uh, go go through quickly what it was that you posted, and then we'll we'll have a yeah, chat. Yes. So oh. that day, I was feeling a little bit. I was feeling frustrated first of all because I was sitting doing as we all do, where we, you finish work, flip for Instagram, and seeing this kind of story, and then seeing everyone's response to it, and it just wasn't very nice from what is a community of health professionals, you know first and foremost we are all human beings but we are all shared in this kind of online community whether people listening are a part of it or not of of musculoskeletal therapists whatever whatever individual profession you are and basically what i saw and i have seen previously is people come up with claims and the the relatively common uh response is it basically becomes personal and it's about that person um and then other people would say, oh, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't call out that stuff or whatever. My, my kind of stance, at least four days ago when we spoke about this, and I think still to now having thought about it extensively this week, is if there's a poor claim and it's on social media and it's a potentially dangerous, people say the word, uh, I won't say it on a podcast, but BS, you'll all know what that you stands for. You can say it. We're, we're not bothered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Bull- yeah. yeah. So so firstly and actually someone pointed out to me as well should we be even using the word as soon as you use the word bullshit you're automatically kind of taking it outside the realms of a professional behavior so should we even be using that word might be one one word is like maybe we should come up with another word because it's hard to say oh that's a you know that's a that's a bullshit claim and then track back and it not be somewhat you know you're you're definitely being inflammatory to the situation um but my view was that if if there's um a narrative or a claim or someone promoting a product that is not with the best intentions and it's not necessarily true and that they are um yeah yeah they're, they're not 
putting out the best info and they're in and crucially they're in a position of responsibility like these people whether they like it or not they've got you know 12 million or something subscribers between them um then saying providing counter information and providing uh um you know basically calling out that claim I don't think is unacceptable. If the claim, if, if social media is being used as a vehicle to project that claim, then using the same platform to counteract it isn't unprofessional. So that was my first point is that people were saying calling out BS is unprofessional. And I think it's not, but I think it can be done in an unprofessional way. And what I don't like personally is someone makes a bad claim, you know, I'll say it and I'm sure, I'm sure I still do. I'll say things and they're not hundred percent true and not everyone's human. We're not all perfect. We'll say things, but if someone's saying things with bad intentions, um, then like with all healthy discussion and debate, if you think one way and I think another way, my issue and my counter argument is with, is with the claim and is with what you said and with the message and how else we could look at that message and it's not about you and i think that's what i didn't don't like particularly is when someone makes a claim someone disagrees with the claim and they make it about the person making the claim and not about the actual claim and that's what i kind of got frustrated i was like guys you know we're all healthcare professionals we're all obviously going to think slightly different about everything infinitely but one thing we do have in common is that we are all humans and they have made a claim it is bad um and and we should and we should say actually here's some counter information we you know unanimously we don't agree with that but it shouldn't be this hugely incendiary personal Tirade. attack on those individuals yeah and and that that was kind of my point as well people missed a, a massive chance there a massive opportunity and part of it i think is because and, and i I love this. It's a quote attributed to, to Mike Tyson is social media has made people way too comfortable with disrespecting others and not getting punched in the face for it. Yeah. Ah, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, as, as, as someone who's competed in mixed martial arts and been punched in the face and gotten paid for it. Yeah. I think, you know, there's something to be said about how humbling that can be and how much that stopped me from just getting incendiary on social media for the sake yeah. of being, an asshole and putting a fire up someone's ass, you know, lighting a firecracker and running away. And people have missed the opportunity in using it to display the right information and instead took it as an opportunity to just throw mud and yeah. throw mud and use that throwing mud to boost their own profile, which in my opinion is just as bad as the claims uh, or just as dangerous as the claims that they were making, because not only are you as a person of influence now using your platform to throw shit at someone else, which is pretty, pretty nasty, but okay, whatever. You know, I swear at people all the time, usually while I'm driving. Fantastic. <laughs> but you're also showing the people that follow you that it's okay to behave like that. And I've gotten into many discussions on people's Instagrams and I've tried to keep things nice and cheery, but then they, you know, want to get personal, which is okay. I'm a grown up, but I realize that this is only happening in particular places because there is a atmosphere created on these profiles where it's okay to just be a dick mm. and that's not okay. They wouldn't say that to my face. And if you're not going to say it to my face, you shouldn't say it at all. You should mm. either be ballsy enough to say those exact same claims to the person's face. So, okay, go hard in the paint. If you want, if you're going to be grown up enough to be able to say it to their face or speak about it in a nice professional manner that you would have done, which is what you highlighted as well. Do it in that professional way. You can highlight the errors without dragging someone through the mud. And yeah. I think it, it's really a little bit outrageous for someone to create a whole post of just tarnishing someone, chatting shit and throwing shit on someone mm -hmm. just for a few more clicks and likes and follows. Yeah. That's just as despicable. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, really agree. It's um, and I think the uh, the 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 thing I really liken it to, and I really admire it, is the sport rugby. You you go out and the everybody on that pitch is there to win, and they, I'm sure everyone listening knows rugby. They beat the crud out of each other for eighty minutes, 
And no matter what the calls are, that or the referee says, or whether they couldn't, they couldn't disagree more with the referee's calls. And some guys hit them in, <laughs> hit them in the face three times during the game. The end of the whistle goes. They all shake hands and they'll all have a pint because, as people, they get on. But their their let's say inverted commas claims during the game is to claim to win, and they want the best for them. You don't then after the final whistle is gone take that message further and i and i would liken it to that it's like someone else is making their claim and their belief and if it's an incorrect claim and it's you know potentially dangerous and it's not true then don't drag it down and and drag it into a a war of of them personally and remember that probably a lot of people who you know my page is pretty small but i've got clients that follow me i've got friends family that follow me it's not cool to do a post that just it's like putting in a shop window this is a load of rubbish like that's not that's not nice and I want and I'll hold my hands I once did it and I still think about it to this day I'm I'm probably the most overthinking conscientious person you've ever met my conscience is like a loud speaker in my head yeah it's a blessing and a curse I think I once did it where there was a post by a big account and they basically were showing an exercise technique and what I didn't like was the they were showing an exercise technique and it was a male uh male therapist and a female model and the way he was it was about it was about something in the pelvic area and the way he was grabbing her and twisting her and moving her and just putting his hands on it was cringy to watch it was I couldn't watch it I was like this is really bad and I didn't like it I remember seeing it and thinking like you know this is a healthcare professional and there's no consent there's no even it literally just moving this this girl around like a model and I post about it saying you know and 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 in that case it, it's difficult because it's not like an infographic or a video like this is an actual person I posted and I and I did highlight at the time I said like, like should we really be behaving in this way or doing a video it might be that they gave consent but maybe we should at least you know with every single patient all of us ever see hopefully we'll get in and we'll go you know got consent for treatment great great now we're going to do the assessment are you okay if I move your leg you know yeah we're getting verbal consent before we do it and so why would that not be the case for a video online if it's the same scenario? And, you know, obviously it got a lot of engagement and I ended up deleting, this was a story, this is about 18 months ago. I ended up deleting it because I felt like actually, you know, am I now in the wrong because I'm personally calling out that person? And Hmm. what I was, what I was trying to do was highlight what they were doing and not the person. I didn't have a problem with the person. I think it's really difficult from my little one experience, maybe why I thought about it so much is it's really, really difficult to to do it like that. And sometimes it can be difficult to not make it personal because you're making it about a claim that a person's made. So I think it's it takes some thought, um, but we're all well qualified professionals. Like before you counteract uh, an argument, think about what it is you're going to say and go, actually, is that am I am I now making this personal personal and therefore raising it up a bar uh, is kind of like my lesson that I've learned. Yeah. Fair. I think that's fantastic. And the thing is social media is such a great and powerful tool. And we've highlighted the fact that, yeah, you can have thousands of followers. You can have a lot of influence on people and social media is never going to be outside on the playground, the happy place. It would be foolish of us both to sit here and say to the audience that it should always be smiles and rainbows. There, there will be, there will be assholes, there will be trolls, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that we have to promote that behavior. I think at the end of the day, we need to be, as my uh, MMA coach always says, higher level human beings. Mm. And only through being higher level human beings are we going to be able to elevate everybody around us. And I think that's something he's done amazingly with the team. And it's something that I take into my work, into my ethics of what I do as much as I can. And that's not to say that I don't trash people. Of course I do. We're all human, but I do my utmost not to do it in any kind of public forum. Yeah. And if I've got a gripe with someone, I'm you know likely to bring it up with you rather than say it behind your back. Yeah. Um, I'm a big boy now. Yeah, you know, I wear my big boy pants and I think that's how we should behave. To purposefully try to throw mud for your clicks and whatnot is no better than the act of disseminating misinformation. Realistically, that's what it was when you look at it, or, or even just catastrophizing beliefs, which someone might have, which Jared Hall pointed out, actually, you know, people have a tough time already as it is 
and now we're going around telling them you sleep bad. Yeah. What the fuck are we doing? Fair point. Absolutely a fair point and a, a good way to put it. Can't remember the exact post. I think that's really as far as it should go in terms of them pointing them out. And then everything after that should, we should be looking at elevating the the bar in terms of providing the evidence to say, actually, it, it doesn't matter if you sleep on your side, if you sleep on your back, if you sleep on your tummy, whatever, you just need to sleep in whatever position's comfortable for you. Because just like posture, there's never, ever going to be one perfect position unless we're all, you know, set in a pod like the matrix or something like that yeah yeah i think that's uh i i really like what you said about jared hall said there like i think our job as as healthcare professionals as well is we're trying to resolve people's issues like people should have their contact with us through whatever means virtual in person however their contact with healthcare professional and when they leave our contact or as they go through that journey their problem or multiple problems should be reduced in number we shouldn't be adding things to their problem list overtly which as soon as you do a cnn article about that it, to some people that will have added a problem to their problem list that they didn't that wasn't a problem before that's not right so therefore our counter argument should be why should people take this off their problem list for some people let's say hypothetically it's now a new problem we could get rid of that problem not attack the person who made the problem because you know that's that's not the right thing to do just my it, i think it's such a great discussion to have and everyone's everyone's going to have their own kind of stance on it the other side of the coin is misleading post was put out but at the end of the day i know for a fact for myself and also for students that i've met afterwards who have been my interns and also for students while i was studying bob and brad as have physio tutors and athlean x have all played a role in a lot of people qualifying as physiotherapists and a lot of people getting good exercises and a lot of people getting good information that has helped and one thing when the way that the majority of social media didn't like from the looks of it uh in the healthcare profession and then someone lit a bonfire there and it's mm. nuts you completely neglect any of the other work that they've done and that's yeah. also quite a shame i think there is a it's a saying that something like you can do 99 great deeds uh and they'll instantly be forgotten about as soon as you make one mistake or you you know you have that one day where you you, you lose your temper or whatever and suddenly those 99 good things that you did are all worthless and maybe that we could uh, apply to this and i i think the the ones it's the the accounts or the people that are consistently posting misinformation i probably should add consistently posting misinformation with the intention or their reason for posting it is either self-promotion or financial gains or they have some kind of motive for posting it because i can 100 percent tell you that in at some point in stuff i've done podcasts my posts on instagram which i spend many a fun saturday afternoon making if someone could look down them and say oh actually like that's probably now been proven otherwise or that's quite different that's fine. And I'll absolutely, if I've said something wrong, you know, tell me because constantly it's going on. If you're posting it with the wrong intention, and then I think that's an issue and that's where we should counterclaim it. Whereas if someone posts something and it's wrong or they say something, it's wrong. And actually you've just got into information to counteract that. If you make it a personal battle and go, yeah, bare knees, this, he's that, he's that, because he said that you're the only person in the wrong there because uh, I'm not, I haven't purposefully said that, said something wrong. I, you know, I've, gen I've made a genuine mistake. That's fine. Tell me about it. And all of us make mistakes every day from, you know, big ones up to small ones, like putting an extra thing of sugar in your tea and forgetting that you only like one. And you have to. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is we're, we're in a science profession as well. And yeah. the science is constantly evolving. Yeah. What was right last week is probably going to be disproven next week. Yeah. And when I have this, uh, these discussions with, with students, one of the best examples I give them is a really good buddy of mine from training, um, always loved reading research. And he read one time that cold showers, the best thing since sliced bread. So after that cold showers, and then the next week, literally the next week, and I'll, it was hot showers are the best thing. And cold showers are bad for you. And then the week yeah. after that, there was another article on how cold showers are beneficial. And then he was back to cold showers. And yeah. this is the thing with any kind of scientific profession where there is ongoing research. 
we're going to find out so much. And yeah. there's things that you and I were taught at university not six yeah. years ago that are going to be disproven in probably another five or six years. Absolutely. Like hands-on yeah. was the way to go. And now we're finding out more and more. Actually, we need people to be self-reliant. Or Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. so many different aspects. That are all, like you said, there's a post you did that's probably going to be wrong at some point multiple and yeah. one thing that um i have also posted about once i was very very lucky at bournemouth uni at the time i was there the lecturing staff were just amazing i couldn't have higher words of praise it was brilliant and one thing that they got across so clearly was that if we spend you know as students we'd be like right you know we've got an hour can you teach her how do we do this mobilization uh, how do we what how do we do that exercise and they would say, no, 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 we're going to spend the hour teaching you how to decide what the right technique would be to do. Or nice. how do you determine which exercise is best? Because that way, in five years, with new information that's available, you'll then learn. So it's like, don't give someone a fish if in the same amount of time you can teach them how to fish, because then they, they can be self-proficient for ages. And one thing that I referenced in my final university, we had to do a talk as the, as the uh, assessment was... Uh, about how quickly medical knowledge doubles. So it's in the 1950, I mean, it was, don't quote me exactly, it was, it would have, in 1950, it would have taken at that rate 50 years for our knowledge of medicine to double, right? To go from one to two. And in 1970, it was down to like 13 years or something for, for knowledge of medicine to double. And then I think it was in 2010, it was something like every three months, every 78 days or something for it to double. With COVID, it's probably doubling every few days, right? <laughs> Our understanding of what's going on. If you start writing an, an essay, by the time you finish, probably one of your references isn't right anymore. And that's so important, isn't it? Um, uh -huh. You know, maybe something that we talked about in the first sort of half segment, if you like, of this podcast, I would probably say quite confidently, it might be that by the end of this decade maybe by the end of this year there might be something that i say actually that's a bit more nuanced or i don't think i was correct there or this new information would would suggest we could do it else an, another way nice i think you know that's probably as good a bit as any that we're going to have to tie it up with a nice <laughs> neat bow look um for the audience listening on if we go back to nutrition yeah. What would you say would be the top two or three things that you'd like to impart on the listeners? Yeah. Uh, the top two or three things would be um, stay within your scope. So we're all physiotherapists. That's our main thing. Um, we wouldn't be very happy if dietitians and nutritionists started prescribing rehab exercises. Um, but um, don't suddenly think because you've read a nutrition article or listened to this podcast that you think nutrition is the be all and end all. You know, you can recover from an injury with not great nutrition, the same as you can recover from an injury with not great sleep. And you can recover from an injury doing a, not an amazing rehab plan. But if you can get all three of those boxes, you're going to dramatically, drastically increase your chance. So don't try and be something you're not. Uh, make sure you're aware that it forms part and parcel. But crucially, if it does, if it, if it, at the right time and place, a patient could improve their nutrition and you think that that a nutritionist or dietitian or some nutrition information will be useful and you know how to refer on them to then do and the basic things that you could talk about are if they want to recover from an acute injury they're getting enough calories they're hitting their protein goal they're avoiding any nutrient deficiency and at bare minimum you have a conversation around discussing that around so they're fueling their training well and i think if those four things i'll add on five that their overall diet is a healthy diet and they're getting all their five fruit, fruit, fruit and veg those five things are five things that you can just have a nice conversation about and say with confidence you're not making a dietary prescription you're just saying this is important energy protein fueling their training plenty of fruit and veg fantastic thank you very much that Ben, really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you being able to speak with us. Um, yeah, where can people find you as well? Yeah, no, th firstly, thank you so much for inviting me. It is truly, um, my heart skipped a beat when you invited me. So true, and, and not no, that's that's if you're nervous that you say that. Um, I don't know the right saying, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
like my face lit up with a grin when you invited me on Sonny. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to chat. Um, so be- definitely the best the place I'm on most is Instagram where my handles, uh, fizzy nutrition, which is a very, very nuanced way of spelling poor smash of physio and nutrition together p h y s i u t r i t i o n um yeah physio 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 and nutrition with you in the middle and i'm pointing at you sonny fantastic i like it i like it <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good my one. thing yeah ah fantastic uh look, thank you very much really appreciate it and uh yeah i hope to speak to you again in the future mate well ladies and gents thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time.